And we are recording. Okay. Share that screen. Here we go. Uh, all right, everybody see that? Yes. Okay. All right. So, um, um, all right. So, what's referred to as mid century modern, which, you know, just after World War II until, you know, into the 1960s. Um, and according to the Abrams Guide, the United States was the last of the major Western countries to embrace modernism, although American designers had long been aware of the developments in Europe, largely through translations of German design publications. When it first emerged in the 1930s, modernism in the United States formed a battleground between opposing camps. On the one hand, the Bauhaus expatriates and those with architectural leanings who favored spare functional design. On the other, a traditional-minded public and followers of the French approach for whom aesthetics were the priority and functionalism too austere and dehumanized. The conflict for dominance of the new market for uh, of the new market came to an abrupt, uh, abrupt conclusion with the outbreak of World War II. As the war ended, a second wave of modern design swept across the United States. Now known as mid-century modern, it was a homegrown style enabled by new petroleum-based plastics, foam, and fiberglass, and technologies developed for wartime. Spearheaded by innovations of Charles and Ray Eames, Aero Saarinen and George Nelson. Uh, George Nelson was an engineer in the army during World War II. Uh, and uh, he designed for Herman Miller. Uh, Saarinen designed for Noel and the Eameses designed for Herman Miller. Um, okay, so um, the so a lot of this, like, you know, mid-century modern, embraced by a victory-proud public, open to new ideas. Um, and um, it offered the right products at the right time, at the right price. It was also the first true original American style. The period also brought new kinds of living space. High-rise urban apartment houses in the cities and ranch style house ranch style residences in the suburban developments that sprang up to fill the need for housing in an exploding post-war economy in these homes a new generation of young families lived a casual lifestyle that precipitated changes in both the look and layout of interiors parallel to the evolving design climate was a sharper definition between the roles of furniture and product designers and those who created interiors. Interior design matured from its origins with Elsie DeWolf at the turn of the century into a serious and financially significant profession that mirrored the explosive growth of the American furniture industry. Mid-century modern coexisted with more historicist based styles and its contemporary and is contemporaneous with the international style in interiors. Despite its originality, it did not become dominant in the United States, although half a century later, it has enjoyed a major revival in the early years of the 21st century. Um, yeah, so uh, one thing that also um, helped to create uh, the profession of the interior designer is steel frame construction and tall buildings. So with commercial space and with residential space, that's a lot of square footage that needs to be designed. And the architects are really not trained to do that. So um, the, uh, like Knoll International, uh, I'll talk a little bit about Florence Knoll um, once we you know look at this. 
um, this presentation. Um, she created the null planning unit, which was an in, really like an interior design firm within Knoll International, which was a furniture company. And she married Hans Knoll, who was the um, um, the son of the founder. Um, and she, you know, part her role there, she was an architect and designer and, um, you know, she, she, you know, started out getting, you know, they need, they got work doing interior, what was called interior decorating. And she started to really remake interiors because as she put it, everything was so bad, it was easy to see what to do. Hans Noll died um, scouting a uh, site for a factory. Uh, he died in a car crash and she took over um, from like the late forties to the late sixties. So she, she, you know, Florence Knoll ran Knoll International for, um, for 20 years. Uh, and so we will, uh, eventually we're going to look at some more of her stuff, but, um, you know, the interior designer, this is like the age, you know, like post world war two, where you see the career and the professional discipline of interior designer emerge. But let's get to some of the uh, low-cost housing for all of the returning uh, soldiers from world, you know, soldiers, Marines, uh, sailors, airmen, um, Levittown. So this is like a prefab community um, and prefab parts delivered to the site, assembled on the concrete uh, foundation. So this is just, you know, single level. Um, and this is, you know, this is industrial production at work. Um, these, um, these, you know, like um, planned communities um, were also um, known for being racist and keeping non-white people out of them. Uh, that is also part of the history of it. Um, but they um, really, what they did for interiors, you know, there are new, there are new products that are, that are being, uh, that are being developed like refrigerators, washing machines, televisions. Um, and like you see, like the industrial materials, the stainless steel countertop and um, it's, um, you know, this is the kind of thing that, um, before World War II, I don't think that this would have been acceptable. Nice color though, right? Fifties. This is some of this, um, uh, chaotic, but you know, new materials like, um, linoleum. Uh, for mica, these uh, synthetics for surfacing. Um, you know, there's all of this, like these new kinds of appliances that are coming into the home. And um, I like some of the choices here, but you can see how these, like the way these, like on the advertisement on the right, the different options for how you would like compose with these, um, uh, cabinets and appliances. Uh, contemporary furniture from the 1950s. So this is sort of like a um, mass produced mid century modern. So steel frame, a little weird, like that's a canvas, uh, the canvas seat back and arm. So here, this like, you know, mod this uh, French interior from the fifties looks like, um, somewhat like it came out of this. 
uh, a nicer one. This is really still <clears throat> um, a good example of the more traditional kind of interior that you would still find. Uh, this this really looks like it's uh, still from the uh, from the Art Deco era. Nice, a little bit, a little heavy on the lavender, but I don't live there. Um, TVs, a new appliance, a new thing to design. Satellites, it's the space age. It's the nuclear age. Um, you know, there's all this you know, optimism and anxiety. You know, the threat of nuclear war is now real for people. Um, and, you know, the United States comes out as the big winner in World War II. And then immediately the Soviet Union is a threat. So um, there is a sort of, you know, parallel, parallel um, threads of optimism and anxiety. I really love this thing that they would do in the 50s with this opaque glass where you would see these shadows from whatever's on the other side of it. Very mysterious. Nice and very um, generous ceiling. up in the Hollywood Hills. I love this projection, this projection out into space. So here, so the, you know, in some places, especially, you know, people who are, uh, you know, really like, you know, uh, if you can afford it, um, if you are stylish, you might, you might commission one of the you know, okay, modern, uh, modern house. And yeah, so. Uh, Charles and Ray Eames are a married couple, not brothers. Ray is the woman. And, you know, they were, ex they were um, very interested in experimenting with the possibilities, like what the potential is for these modern materials. So this is their uh, case study house, which is really this very interesting collage. Uh, you see in the foreground to the right the Eames lounge chair with the uh, you know with the ottoman. That's that's a design classic. That one is still is still manufactured by Herman Miller. But you know you see the use of plywood. Um, you know it's just the uh, it's like more industrial, almost like warehouse. Um, you know. So sort of, I guess, yeah, it's just kind of like a, the, see, like the roof is more like it's um, the roof of a warehouse. Here's some of their furniture that was uh, designed for Herman Miller. Uh, this is a contemporary of, I guess, sort of an Australian contemporary um, this um, you know, black, white, red, yellow, blue. This is a very modernist. So sort of almost goes back to the early, like the Bauhaus style of mod of modernism with the uh, black, white, and primaries. But a nice looking refrigerator. Yeah, that like looks like a modern kitchen. Just you know if you just update the appliances. There, Mondrian. Um, so here, 
uh, Eames plastic armchair. So molded plastic, fiberglass, uh, styrofoam. These are new materials that are being used for furniture. Uh, mass so you know furniture with uh, there's a strong demand for furniture like large like large um, amounts of furniture for uh, you know large corporations. Um, there's a lot of growth happening in the United States in the 1950s. So um, steel, plastic, fiberglass, styrofoam. And, you know, there is this really this like love affair with industry and all the, the, the possibilities. Um, Eero Saarinen, this uh, tulip chair on the right, he, um, he really was, uh, you know, his, um, he designed for Knoll. He was an old like friend of Florence Knoll from early years. And um, he really believed in the potential of industry to um, not just allow them to mass produce things, but also to make beautiful things. Uh, Eames dining chairs. I do like these. These are quite nice. Um, you know, they didn't completely neglect natural material like wood. And the Saarinen womb chair. So that has a molded plastic structure that has styrofoam and uh, fabric upholstery with a steel frame for the uh, for the structure for the for the legs. George Nelson coconut chairs. So you know they're getting um, you know they're, they're really getting more artistic with the furniture, where it starts to become kind of like sculpture. And I do like the, uh, this like, you know, it looks like a section off of like a little piece off of a coconut shell. Harry Bertoya, also designed for Knoll. Um, kind of, you know, similar. You can see they're working with some similar ideas. You know, the coconut chair and this Bertoya chair, not, you know, this like, well, the chairs on the left, similar idea, and the same with that. But, you know, they're all, you know, into this, like, there's this, um, it's in the air. Kind of like the, uh, you know, like with Art Nouveau, a lot of different people worked with the same idea, you know, did their own thing with it. Uh, Palette table by Isamu Noguchi. That no, should be Noguchi. Uh, he was a sculptor and industrial designer, designed a lot of furniture, and also made a lot of fine art sculpture. That was a nice, uh, nice image of the structure of these George Nelson lamps. Lawrence Knoll showrooms for Knoll International. And CBS Executive Office in New York. Uh, the sofas are her design. Um, those chairs are a Mies van der Rohe design. Here is a Chase Manhattan Bank in New York by Davis Allen at SOM. You see the uh, Barcelona chair is in the foreground. George Nelson action office. Um, you're not really supposed to sit down and get comfortable in that chair. So office. So this is like the beginning of uh, um, Herman Miller and Noel start designing office systems, like office furniture systems that are meant to, you know, it's sort of like, you know, um, coordinate with the modern office building. So, um, Both so popular today. Yeah. <laughs> Not cheap, so. That is, you know, that it's like, they, now, I mean, nowadays, as, you know, Noel makes its money 
with office oh, like, Barcelona, office stuff like office supply office furniture um so scandinavian modern alvar alto uh bent birch plywood was um a material that alto worked with a lot so here's the uh, photograph of the um, laminate. So you can see the guy, like what the guy on the right is holding, he's hold, there's like several thin slices of, of the wood and they're bending, they're bending them. It's like when you like heat, you use heat and moisture to bend, to get wood to like be supple enough to bend it. And then you glue the laminate, these like pieces of laminate together and you create a strong, uh, you know, a, a, a very strong piece of uh, laminated wood. An Alvar Alto stool from the 1930s. Um, Arne Jakobsen. These chairs are still manufactured and used and uh, used as um, contemporary design. I've seen them used in, you know, some of the most contemporary buildings, and they fit right in. So a lot of this, you know, like the mid-century modern. Um, Kind of is it is you know it established a style that really hasn't uh, disappeared, and they're very flexible in how you you know how you can use them, but they work well in modern in in modern buildings. Ant chair, the chair. Um, Hans Wegner is another another Danish designer who designed some really beautiful furniture. Um, yeah, there's one chair called the Papa Bear chair that is extremely comfortable. There. Um, and I want to talk a little bit. I'm not going to get too much into all of the work of Le Corbusier, but I want you to see... I just did some of his furniture because it's furniture that you will see uh, mainly like this is a first like a uh, version of the Grand Comfort with the structure on the outside um, this is an old early version of the chair. Uh, now you see these chairs that are much tighter, like those, like, you know, leather sections are very, uh, a lot, they're, they're a lot more, a lot straighter, more rigid. This is kind of cool. This is almost like a sculpture. Looks like um, um, Klaus Oldenburg is a, a Scandinavian sculptor who made these like, like soft sculptures uh, this looks kind of like a Oldenburg. That's via Savoy. Let's look at that. So, um, stop that. Don't get too much into Corby. Now, Flono. So here, let's talk a little bit. So this is uh, on the Knoll website, the designer bios. There's Florence Knoll, uh, born to a baker, orphaned at age 12. She grew up in Saginaw, Michigan. Uh, she was enrolled at Kingswood School for Girls, adjacent to the Cranbrook Academy of Art. It's in a very um, uh, nice area north of Detroit. Uh, it's in Bloomfield Hills, which is... Um, some of the, uh, you know, 
some of the wealthiest people in the Detroit area. You can see here there is this uh, Florence uh, Florence Noel Bassett died uh, early this year at age one hundred and one. So she, uh, you know, she retired a long time ago, but um, so she befriended, um, you know, she basically she just got to, she got to know people. She was in a, you know, she was lucky to to be um, adopted by a family that could put her into a good school. And so here's some like Florence Knoll through the ages. Mm -hmm. So she met she met Hans Knoll in 1941. And there are some of her designers. Now here, I love this, like, this is the kind of thing that she would do with uh, planning for interiors is that, you know, she would take the floor plan and cover it in the materials that she was using for the surfaces. And this is like much more organized than what other people had done previous previously. Uh, so you could get an idea of what the colors were going to look like. She had, uh, she developed a system for organizing samples. Um, she, you know, created um, presentation boards with drawings, plans, samples, uh, photographs, and she brought them to client meetings and she discussed with the client what the, you know, what the interior design and what the plan was going to be. Um, very, um, uh, very important in just sort of like, sort of pushing interior design to a much, uh, much higher level. So um, this little bit of text here, in creating the revolutionary null planning unit, she defined the standard for the modern corporate interiors of post-war USA. Drawing on her background in architecture, she introduced modern notions of efficiency, space planning, and comprehensive design to office planning. She ardently maintained that she did not merely decorate space, she created it. The planning unit rigorously researched and surveyed each client, assessing their needs, defining patterns of use, and understanding company hierarchies before presenting a comprehensive design. So she got to know her client, which is something that like now you have, now that's just what you do. Uh, she introduced this. Um, you know, she had to go in and talk to uh, groups of men and persuade them to, you know, to buy their furniture, to buy their textiles, to execute the design as she designed it. Um, so, and she also sold modern design. She was really good at presenting, you know, um, um, you know, really sort of like, you know, selling people the idea of interior design, like as a way of, um, it's almost like, it's like, um, your company's self-expression. So she designed furniture and she designed it as she needed it. Um, you know, if she found that there was something that she wanted something for a space she was designing and nothing, you know, nothing that they, that they, that they were selling quite fit. Um, she would just say, you know, she would design it herself. So some of these, this furniture, the bench, the lounge chair, the settee and the sofa, uh, these are designs that uh, she came up with out of necessity. And it's, um, you know, it is pretty timeless. Yeah. Can't go wrong. So there you are. So I'll, you know, uh, take a moment and thank Florence Knoll for doing her thing. Uh, look her up and read more about her. She's a very interesting person. Um, you know, she 
um, she became a leader in uh, furniture design and interior design uh, when you know either there weren't there really wasn't any interior design yet um, or you know she just uh, you know there was sort of like there was nothing there so she just stepped in and created it I recall seeing an interview with her and she said that you know when she first started out uh, companies would just have a purchasing agent go through like flip through a catalog you know we need you know 300 desks and they would just like flip through a catalog and say like uh just get that one and that was how they chose their furniture and then it would show up and they would just put it wherever um and so you know they have like a lot of heavy wooden like you know oaken cabinets um everything on the floor uh she she uh introduced the idea of wall mounted wall mounted uh cabinets for filing to get stuff off the floor and um you know so she introduced a lot of a lot of new ideas that as i they already you know as i as i said before um you know she said that a lot of a lot of what she saw was so bad it was very easy to come up with a solution that would be better so let's see i want to see how much Let's order one of these chairs. Uh, up five thousand six hundred and one dollars. I like the orange. Yeah, look at that. Six weeks to get this. All right, let's add to cart. Proceed to checkout. Yeah, I'm not really going to buy this chair. Um, if only I do like that chair. Okay. Uh, yeah, so you can shop the Florence Knoll collection. Uh, if you look at, like, in the classics, you have none other than Mies van der Rohe. They sell the Barcelona chair. Barcelona stool, Barcelona stool with cowhide sling, Verno chair, Barcelona couch, the MR chair. I like the Four Seasons bar stool. That's nice. Yes, created for the Four Seasons restaurant, not Four Seasons Total Landscaping. Cool. I like it. All right, so that's um, that's mid century. Any questions about this? No questions. Ruby. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Um, all right. So um, we're off next week. There is the um, uh, Christy Yarbrough Tuesday evening. Um, if you have questions, you can ask me. Um, and um, you know, just use the use the link that I sent for the Zoom meeting. And if you've got questions for her, or you can you know get them ready ahead of time if you just want to listen to what she has to say and uh, learn a little bit about the you know how like what what someone's experience doing interior design is like. That that's also cool. You don't have to ask her any questions. Um, and um, when we come back, we're going to have one meeting, and then it's going to be finals week. And um, I want to talk about that. Our like next time, the next time I'm going to talk about um, um, pop and postmodern, and get into a little more uh, contemporary, like something just as close as I can to the current day. Um, you know, um, honestly, this, there's, there's interesting furniture being made all the time. Um, and we can talk about like what's happening in 
interior design now. Um, it's uh, actually right now uh, the uh, you know the coronavirus um, is you know means that uh, you know people currently are very like very quickly working to adjust and adapt to some very you know some very important needs. I've seen um, I've seen some articles uh, that that are you know openly wondering if the open plan office is finished. You know, open plan offices. I find I've worked in um, open plan offices, and uh, they, I can't stand it. Really, it's noisy. Uh, it's distracting. Uh, the idea of the open plan office is that everyone's this big, you know, one great big brain, and they're all like, you know, you can just go walk over and talk to somebody, ask somebody a question, share ideas. Um, but it's really hard to work, and so you need to put on headphones or something like that. And then you end up just shutting everybody out so that you can accomplish, you know, you can just get something done. Um, so it's more. I think, a, I'm sorry for interrupting you. I think now more than ever, everybody questions if the office is finished, period. You know, yes. not just the open space. Exactly. So where do we work? Uh, yeah. You know, and I can say right, you know, for myself, um, it's distracting to work at home. You know, home is home, work is work. Um, and so we have to find, you know, something else like this almost like, is there a different place, a different way we can work? You know, you can work from anywhere in, you know, not all the time, but in some cases you can work from anywhere. Um, so, you know, either I have to set up my home differently or, you know, Find or rent something in Florida and go and go work there for the winter. Find some place to you know, so find some place to, you know, some you know, yeah, and you know everybody won't do that or can't do that. I mean, you can't if you have children, you can't just say like, "Hey, we're gonna, you're going to school in Florida for six months." Um, I mean, of course, nowadays, yes, but this is gonna this is gonna end. We've got vaccines coming, so and you know, I'm sure like. You know, most of us are are ready to like have a little bit more freedom of um, movement. So, but you know the um, but you know all that to say the you know people are you know at least like are really constantly thinking about this. Even you know, fifteen years ago, I remember work you know uh, teaching at a you know teaching at Harrington, and we had a. You know, they moved us into this uh, office building. Uh, you know, they moved the campus. It was 2003. They moved the campus to a high-rise, more modern office building, and we had all these conversations about, you know, what is our, what's our workspace going to be like? And, um, you know, the owners, the owner of the school, ended up just going kind of cheap, uh, which was too bad. Um, but um, you know, the idea of having like my like my own office as a like full time, full time faculty, um, head of one of the departments. They still wouldn't give me my own office. I was like, well, I need. It's like like you know the idea that nobody needs any privacy, um, is you know pretty. It's just pretty common. You know, um, it's it's just to me it's weird. It's very very weird. So. Um, I don't know. We're going to see. We're going to see what happens. But if you got, if you decide to go into commercial design, um, you are going to be a part of that. All right. Um, where is my? There we go. All right. So I will stop the recording now.